Thank you, worship team. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Lovely day to be here. Hope it stays that way. <laughs> okay, a few announcements that we have today. Uh, Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, is going to be a trustees meeting at 7 o'clock. So all you trustees, be sure you're there. Thursday is going to be adult, vo uh, adult volleyball at 6 o'clock. Uh, good time for those that like to get some exercise in. Then Kids Summer Fun is going to be uh, the night number two, we had the number one uh, a week or so ago, is going to be August 14th, this coming uh, Sunday, and it's for ages 8 through 12 at 6 o'clock here at the church. The Sunday School Church Picnic is going to be the next week, so Sunday, August 21st at 1 o'clock at the KOE in Westfield. And then there's the I Am Loved event. Uh, in the town park and they're still collecting uh, things for school supplies and the box is out in the breezeway so if you have some supplies you want to get in be sure you do that because uh, the deadline is the 16th and then eat and greet will be Monday August 22nd at 6 o'clock at the activity center bring an ap appetizer if you're a uh, lady in coming okay then we have several thank yous to read West Portland family, thank you so much for your encouragement and support. I am humbled by your partnership in the gospel. I couldn't serve in South Africa without your support. <clears throat> May the Lord bless and keep you all as we serve him. In him, Abby. And then we have another one. Dear West Portland Baptist Church family, it was a joy to be with you on Father's Day. Thank you for allowing us to, <clears throat> to share an update and a challenge from the Word of God. Thank you for your prayers and financial partnership in helping us see the Old Testament translated for the Higawathan Ecclesiastes is almost done in a, in a rough draft. Our plan, the Lord willing, is to return to the Philippines early next year. Our trip and time away was wonderful, but it's always good to get home. It has been... <clears throat> Uh, very dry here and the temps in the high 90s and 100s and we think we have a hot <laughs> we pray for rain and cooler temps thank you and <clears throat> uh, and thank you God for working air conditioning Lance and Laura and then another one just a little, little note with huge gratitude thank you West Portland Baptist Church congregation for sending me to camp My, uh, I guess my fun part was playing basketball uh, from Nate. So thank you all that have helped pay for that. Then I have a little PSA. It's not a paid advertisement, just a PSA. But uh, Pastor said they, we got some new uh, maps, radio coverage maps for Family Life. If any of you like to listen to Family Life, good Christian music. I'm a little partial because I work there. <laughs> But we do have some new coverage maps out on the table, so help yourselves to those. And we're soon going to have a station, hopefully, that's going to actually cover this area. <laughs> Thank you. You can listen now. You just have to be in your car. <laughs> Don't get inside your house down here in Westfield and think you're going to listen too much. There's some dead spots. So anyway, we're glad that you're all here this morning because there's a whole lot of folks who are away this weekend. They all gang up and they plan together to go on vacation. And then they don't tell me until like right before. But we're glad that you're here today. Lynn is here on vacation. Uh, glad she's here. A couple folks over here with Betty. Glad that you're here uh, on vacation joining us or for whatever reason you're here. We're glad that you're with us today. Uh, we're going to pray for our needs this morning. And there are many needs. There's a list in our bulletin. We do have some good news, a praise. I don't have all the statistics. Maybe Pam has the Pam doesn't even have the statistics. A healthy baby uh, named Amos was born to Ryan and Sarah, so long and so heavy, but we're not sure how long nor how heavy, but nonetheless, a, a healthy baby, and we thank the Lord for that, for that delivery. Uh, maybe those are guarded secrets. Maybe this is a future basketball player came in at, you know, huge, or a football player. I know, I know. Maybe, but anyway, we're, so maybe we'll someday find the statistics out, but we're 
Seven pounds? Well, we got some statistics down front here. How about that? So we thank the Lord for that uh, arrival, and certainly are, they are blessed by their fourth child, and so thank the Lord. Well, let's pray together for the needs that we have in our list here and for all the needs this morning. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today, and we are thankful that you minister to us and encourage us. We are reminded of your goodness to us each and every day how you, uh, for your children, take care of our needs, that you, uh, in little ways and large ways, both uh, help and provide for us. We come to you this day uh, thanking you for spiritual strength, for uh, how you've helped us uh, perhaps when we're overcoming temptation, how you've helped us to uh, gain uh, the foothold of, of following you, perhaps in hard or difficult circumstances. Uh, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you today for answered prayer, how you've answered our prayers many times before, and we come again today to bring our request before you once more. Uh, we pray for all the folks who are listed on uh, the list that's in our bulletin, some with ongoing and long-term needs, others with uh, more near needs and, and near to time, and certainly we pray whether the need is ongoing, long-term or short-term, we commit it to you because in every need you provide. And we thank you for those provisions. We ask for physical needs, for healing of bodies, for wisdom for doctors, for care and rehab for those who are having to uh, do that. We pray that you would provide for families that are affected by the illnesses of their loved ones. And certainly pray that you would minister to them as well. Pray that you would provide for and meet the need of some families who very recently have uh, suffered the loss of a loved one through passing. And pray for those families that you would encourage them, strengthen them, and touch their hearts in these difficult times and in these difficult days. We ask for your provision for our country, the needs of America, the need of wisdom for those who lead, both on a national, state, and even a local level. Uh, pray that you would do a work within our country to draw many in this land to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ by faith and belief and trust in him. Pray that you would provide for the needs that our missionaries have, thanking you for letters that uh, are certainly important for those who have been able to come here and share even recently. But we pray for those who are still overseas, some who have been there for quite a long time, some who have extended their time overseas due to COVID and other circumstances. And while we haven't seen them more, most recently, we certainly are not forgetting them. We pray for them and trust that you will help them to continue to do the work you've called them to and minister through them. And we thank you for all of our missionaries. We ask now for all of our needs, be they unspoken requests that might be upon our hearts, things that are burdening us that can't be shared, or whether it's any other kind of need that might be uh, upon the list or things that we should have perhaps noticed and didn't, or things that uh, we just are unaware of. Uh, you're aware of all, and so we pray that you would minister. We do pray for the many who are traveling uh, right about now in this early August time period for vacation and travels. We just pray that you would keep those who are away in, in, in your care, and thank you for those who are uh, visiting us today, those who are traveling to here, but we certainly pray for all the miles, whether they be to here or away from here or on their way back, that you would keep each one safe. And we'll thank you for all your blessings. We'll trust you to provide for all these needs. And we ask them all through our Savior, Jesus Christ, in his name. Amen. Okay, our scripture reading today is in John chapter 8 verses 1 through 11. That's John chapter 8, first 11 verses. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again unto the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in, his, in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that he might have to, they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stood down and with his finger wrote on the ground. And though he heard them, as though he had heard them not. 
So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone. And again, Jesus, again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. May the Lord richly bless this reading of his word to our hearts. Thank you. We'll have our kids come up for our children's chat this morning. All righty. Wandering up here. Hi there. Oops. Banging my microphone. I do that. How many of you have, how many of you keep a calendar? You? Kind of, Maybe. A true value calendar. Oh, boy, we're doing advertisements now. Where, where did you get that? <laughs> oh, your, your dad got it for you. All right. Well, I have a couple calendars up here just to show you. I, every so often when I see these cheap, like at the dollar store, I get a calendar for advanced planning. Uh, this calendar here has 2022, our current year in it. And then it even has next year in it, so if I need to look at what a date is, I can quickly open a calendar and see what day of the week it might be on. By the way, if you don't have a calendar, do you know what happens one month from today? One month from today, what happens? Well, they know out there. <laughs> one month from today or just thereabouts on September 7th or thereabouts, guess where you're all going? School, yeah, you need a calendar for that. One more month of summer vacation. And I was just in a dollar store and I found this one. This allows me a further year in advance. This has 2024 in it, in case anybody's interested in what you're doing in 2024. Keep your, your act together and square. Some of you might be interested, uh, down in the front row here, that next, next, next June, it looks to me, Although I'm not sure that somewhere around June 20th or 21st is the last day of school for next year, just in case you're looking ahead. And a lot of adults, how many of you keep calendars so that you know where you're supposed to be? You know, some of them are waving, they're waving their phones at me now. They don't keep these paper things, but they have it in their phone. Because we kind of like to know where we're going to be when we're supposed to be there. And here's an interesting verse that talks about putting the calendar in perspective with what we're doing right now, because obviously both are important. In 2 Corinthians, there's a verse that uh, quotes the Old Testament. It says, for he says, in an acceptable time, I've heard you, and in the day of salvation, I've helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You know, when we deal with God, the most important time to deal with God is when? In 2024? Let me see here. I'll, put God, I'll give God a date. Uh, we'll, we'll give him, uh, let's see, August of 2020. Well, April. We'll give him April 18th, 2024. Give God a date. Right, right in there, God's day. That's really what God intends for us to do, is to put him off years from now or days from now or even weeks from now. How many of you are looking forward to all the days before you go back to school? Yeah, you're looking forward to those days, uh, but you're not necessarily looking forward to that appointed day that you might have to get on a bus and go back to school. Uh, when we put God off, we forget something that's important to God. God's more important with us what we're doing when? In 2024, 2023, later this fall. What's important to God right now? It's important to God that you not schedule your prayer for 2024 or six months from now. It's important that you pray when? Today. It's important that if you trust God for salvation, when do you do that? Do you put it off till some way down the line day that who knows when it's going to get here? Or do you do that when? Today, when you understand you might need him. God works in the present, mostly. Now, that's not to say we shouldn't plan ahead and that you shouldn't be ready to go back to school on the appointed day or be ready for next summer vacation on the appointed day. 
But the planning ahead is not near as important as what you do for the Lord today. Now, presently, is the accepted time of salvation. Now is the day. Uh, God's concerned with how you're doing when. You know, tomorrow? Wouldn't you love a God who says, well, I'm really concerned about you, Solomon, but not until two years from now. We'd say, huh? That doesn't sound like the God we worship because God's concerned about us when? Today. Right today. Every day and especially the one we're living today. So, yes, you can keep a calendar in your phone if you choose or on paper if you'd like. But never forget, the most important thing to God isn't all these days that are coming. The most important thing to God is the day that we're currently living. And that's the most important thing to God. So I hope you remember that lesson today and every day. Because every day is the important day that God finds for you. Not someday way down months, years, weeks from now. All right, you can head on back. Yes. No, you can't have one of my calendars because I need those. You have the verse, though. <laughs> these I actually use. I can't give these away. I'll be lost without them. If I get, if I get to 2024, I'll be lost without them. Uh, so anyway, and what day is today? It's Sunday. <laughs> you know, it would be weird if I were here in church on Monday getting ready to preach. That would be an odd thing. My calendar would be off. John chapter 8, we are looking at Jesus one-on-one -on -one with people, and we come to John chapter 8 today. It's an interesting passage, uh, as Gary read it to us, and we're going to look at it a little bit this morning. Uh, how many of you on your phones, they're dialed in to the point that they understand and know when that person, well, probably not a person, but that call that comes in is coming up on your phone as spam risk. Does your phone do that? Spam risk. Uh, some cell phones, the screen turns red, like a warning, you know, warning, warning, you know, don't answer this one. It's, it's not real. It's not a human. It's a spam risk. Uh, I, I always typically answer them just to hear what they're trying to sell me. Uh, they're trying to tell me my taxes are overdue and they're about to throw me in prison. They're trying to tell me my Amazon order that I didn't make is canceled and they need my credit card number so the order can go through. They're trying to tell me the lawsuit that was settled in my favor is done and all this money is just waiting for me. I've just got to call and claim it. Uh, some rich person in Nigeria wants to send me money and get it into America. By the way, that's called illegal money laundering. It's a crime to participate. But hey, you know... They don't care. They're, they're just going to send me a boatload of money from Nigeria. Scams and spams. They're as routine as every day is. We talk about living for today. If you get a day where you don't get a spam or scam phone call, you regard it as a different kind of day because every day uh, we get these. And I want to come to this passage thinking scam or spam because that is just what the Jewish leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees, are trying to do to Jesus. It's as big a scam what they are pulling here in John chapter 8 as most of those calls are. What they have done, though they try to look above board, they try to look so righteous in doing it, they are bringing this woman to Jesus caught in adultery. And so he's there teaching the people, verse 2. He's teaching in the temple. People are coming to him. He's teaching them. He's answering questions. He, it's, it's a very quiet, orderly thing. It doesn't say he's like in many of the cases where he's out in a boat preaching to a large crowd. He's just, people are coming to him and he's interacting with them. And in the middle of this nice discussion, in comes this kind of chaotic situation where the scribes and Pharisees, literally it seems like, drag this lady in, in accusation interrupting the whole thing that Jesus was doing, dragging her in, and righteously saying, we have caught her, we've taken her in the very act of adultery. And then they say, you know, Moses, in the Old Testament, verse 5, said she should be stoned. What do you say about this, Jesus? Boy, this is as big a setup as uh, money coming from Africa. It's as big a setup as your car warranty has expired. You've heard that one too, haven't you, on your, your cell phone? It's just all scam. It's a setup. They want Jesus to either have to say, no, don't stone her. And then they could say, ha ha, he doesn't even agree with Moses in the Old Testament. Or they want him to say, stone her. 
And they'd say, oh, look at this Jesus. He's so unmerciful. He's so ungracious. You know, he's, he just stone everybody. There's no good answer for the question that they're asking him. It's a setup. Now, I can tell it's a setup because there's a couple of things, if you look at this closely, you'll happen to notice. Caught in the very act, and so where is something that's missing here? There's a missing man in this scene. They drag this woman in, caught in adultery. Where is the guy? Good question, huh? Uh, it does, as best I understand things, uh, would require somebody else to be present, also caught in the act. Um, there's a lot of opinions as to why he's missing. Perhaps, he, you know, he was a Jew. They were protecting his identity from the public. Uh, some suggest this lady was a prostitute. That's why they so easily could catch her. That's possible. Some were suggesting they just didn't really care about him. They only needed one to carry on the ruse. And so they grabbed the first person they could come by. We don't know for sure, but it sure says something's wrong here. It keeps saying something's wrong here when they're questioning him about one particular sin. Interestingly enough, although not all of them for moral reasons, in the Old Testament, there are 28 sins where the Jewish people could apply capital punishment to them. Uh, of course, murder being the main one, but also kidnapping, child sacrificing, adultery. Um, another interesting one was an idolater. In the Old Testament, they had the option of capital punishment. They had the option of capital punishment for Sabbath breaking, for false prophets and false witnesses. Uh-oh. False witnesses. Jewish people had the option of stoning those who told lies. Everybody at once, let's all duck, right? You know, that, that was an option. God didn't say they had to, but remember, the Jewish people in the Old Testament weren't just a moral people that were supposed to be moral in their behavior. They were also running a nation. And so they had governmental laws. I found one of the most interesting uh, uh, capital punishment things was if you happen to have a uh, beef animal, I won't pick on all you folks who happen to have those. Gary left and went to Montana just to avoid this moment in the message. So, you know, he's at Glacier Park. He has a couple beef animals. If you have a beef animal that killed somebody and you left the beef animal alive and it killed somebody a second time, guess who gets killed then? You, the owner, in Jewish governmental law, could be killed for allowing your known killer of a beef animal to continue to kill other people. Now, that wasn't moral law. It was the law of government, because the Jewish people in the Old Testament had to run government. Rick says, who has beef animal, he says, we solved that problem. We have electric fence. We don't have that problem anymore. We solved it with just a wire that runs through the, through the pastures and gives those beef animals a charge when they get too close to it. But that was the many, 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 some of them, laws that the Old Testament brings forth. Some of them not because it's moral or not, because it was the running of government and the running of a society and the running of a nation that the Jewish people did, not just being moral before the Lord. So of all those particular instances, they were allowed the option, if they chose to, to have capital punishment. It is probably likely that not many were stoned because their beef cattle were out of control. It is probably likely not the case, but they had the option to do that. And so one of the problems here is with all these potential stonings that could happen or might happen under the government of the Old Testament, they bring this lady in. Why do they bring her in? Because her sin is particularly emotionally tied to people. Any married person gets a sense of being hurt or offended when people cheat on each other within marriage. It just causes us some ill feeling within. It's a, it's a little bit of a hot button of many of these sins that uh, we see this and we say, that's terrible. You know, how could, how could that happen? How could the breakup of, of a family happen? And it, it kind of hurts us. So here she is, 
allegedly committing this sin, caught in the act, that, that destroys families. And you have a sudden feeling like, you know, she's wrong. You just are preconceived in your notion that she's, you know, she's a terrible person, as opposed to necessarily some other sins. By the way, you know one of the other sins that could be considered for stoning? A child who repeatedly is disobedient to parents. Wasn't dictated, but it could happen under the Old Testament law. It was allowed, not commanded, allowed, if the Jewish people so desired to do it. And as such, guess how many of us are in deep, deep trouble when we were growing up? I won't talk about your growing up, but I was in deep, deep trouble when I was growing up. Um, so they didn't bring in a disobedient child. They didn't bring in a guy with an ox that had killed a couple people. They didn't even bring in an adult. They didn't even bring in someone who was a sorcerer or a false teacher or involved in the occult. They brought in the adulterer, the adulteress. Because they're trying to tempt Jesus into a corner as he asks the question and then as he answers it. Verse 6, they tempted him that they might have reason to accuse him. And in all of this, let's just be bluntly honest, how utterly shameful it is, no matter what this woman had done, to use her in this way. Think about that. To use this woman as a pawn in their game to get Jesus is downright pathetic. If there was any stoning that might be gone on, Maybe there should be consideration for what they were doing to this woman, just using her in their scheme to get at Jesus. They didn't care about her. They didn't care about her family. They didn't care about people. They only cared about getting Jesus. That's all they cared about. They were so focused on their hatred of Jesus Christ that the only thing they were concerned about was finding a way to get Jesus trapped in a corner to answer a question that he couldn't answer one way or the other without them being able to point at him and say, See? He's a fraud. That's all they were concerned about. And yet Jesus, in his wisdom, does not answer the question. He removes the accusers. It says he stoops down on the ground and he starts writing on the ground, first as though he heard them not. And so they continued asking him. Uh, a better phrasing, perhaps, for that would be, in a modern term, nagging him. Ever been nagged? Ever been accused of being a nagging? Um, yeah. You know what nagging is? It just makes you get to the point of frustration. Uh, in a car, for all those folks who are away this weekend, if they're watching and they took little kids with them, the question from the back seat that every parent hates to answer is, are we there yet? <laughs> 10 seconds later, the other child, well, are we there yet? Ten minutes later, are we there yet? Are we there yet? we got to be there, aren't we? They rephrase it a little bit, but it's the same question, and it just drives you completely nuts. Nagging. They continued nagging him. He wouldn't answer. He's just doing this writing on the ground as if he didn't even hear their question. And it's beginning to bug them. They start to nag him and say, what are you going to do? What should we do? What do you want to do with this woman? And so finally, after being nagged, he stands up in verse 7, and he says this to them. He says, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And immediately then he stooped back down and started writing on the ground. Wouldn't you love to know what he was writing? We're not told what he was writing. We're not told what he put on the ground. We know that uh, there's some ideas, and we'll go through them quickly, what he might have been writing. But... We're not told what he was writing. We are told what the result of what he wrote was as he wrote it, and that was they begin to leave. But as some theories go, some say he was writing maybe the Ten Commandments. By the way, committing adultery is one of the ten. So maybe he filled in the gap and wrote the other nine out there, one of which is the sin of being bearing a false witness, which is lying. Uh, by the way, the Ten Commandments is impossible for us to keep that's why we can't keep the commandments to ever be saved, because guess what? There's a couple of them that every human that has a grown of age has broken. 
uh, honoring parents and lying and telling the truth are the most commonly broken of the Ten Commandments. Probably going around the room without admission of guilt, though Gary suggested we do this during his Sunday school class, confess our sins one to another. No, he really didn't suggest that. He mentioned it, though. He mentioned it in his lesson. We would be very uncomfortable, but I think less uncomfortable would be if we all had to admit, in my life, as long as I've lived, have I ever lied once? And I think probably all of us would say, yeah. You know, in all the years I've lived, I've lied at least once somewhere, somehow, someplace. Because it's that common. Adultery is not very common, but boy, false witness is. And so maybe he wrote out the commandments, which leaves nobody out to the breaking of them. Uh, another suggestion was he started writing uh, some of the sins of those people who were there accusing the woman. Uh, some suggested he was writing names of women there that they may have been with. Although I find that to be a little, little extreme because I'm not sure every one of these scribes or Pharisees ha had done that. There may have been a couple in the group, but I'm not sure they all were like that. Uh, some of the scribes and Pharisees really did try to be righteous. They thought their salvation was in their human righteousness. And they tried very hard to be righteous and to be obedient. And they thought their salvation was on the line whether they were or weren't. So I'm not sure he was doing that. Some suggest perhaps he was writing all of the sins from the Old Testament that stoning was an option. The 28 I discovered, writing them out one for one. But we don't know. But we do know what the result was. The result was, one by one, from the oldest to the last, they all sneak off. They just kind of, I'm out of here. And then one by one, as they all begin to, to dissipate and sneak away, finally there's none of them left. The accusers as a group are gone. And at that point in time, only the people who were there to start with, the, the ones Jesus was teaching at the beginning of this, are the last of the witnesses left, along with this woman who they left there. And so in verse 9, we have the one-on-one, -on -one brief but important interaction, and we bring us to this point to get to this, that Jesus had with this woman. Obviously, she's there, he's there, and a crowd's there, but the accusers are gone, and he asks her about that. Verse 10, he says, Woman, where are those of thine accusers? We had this group of people coming in to accuse you of sin. Where'd they go? You know, has no man now condemned you? Is there nobody here who is an accuser of this woman? And she responds back, No man, Lord. They've gone, they've left. There's no accusers left. It's just her and Jesus. And Jesus replied to her with a statement that is truly unique and truly important. He says, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And in this statement that Jesus makes to this lady, he identifies with a couple of things. Number one, there is no discussion, there is no debate, there is no, is it wrong or is it right? to commit adultery. There is no question that at that sin perhaps and at many others, just like all of us, this lady was sinful. But at that point in time, Jesus didn't come for a condemnation and a judgment then and there. Jesus, when he was here, did not judge people. The coming of Jesus was not to judge. The coming of Jesus was to provide something we all needed, a way out of judgment. It is not a mission to straighten out the mess that Jesus has ventured into earth to, to do in his first coming. It is a venture to this earth to help us get out of the mess that we're in. It's a rescue mission. And in the midst of this rescue mission where it's all about his love, it's all about his compassion, it's all about what he's very soon to do for this woman and for you and for me years later, going to the cross and dying for us, this is my mission. It's not to stone people. It's to provide people with a way to salvation and forgiveness. I don't condemn you. You need to trust me. You need to follow me. You need to believe upon me and go and change your life as a result of that. And that's what salvation is. Salvation is when we realize some sin or some sins separate us from God. It's a wedge sin is between us and the God of heaven. 
And it's a wedge that we can't break down. It's a wall we cannot penetrate. It's a barrier we cannot go through. We are separated from God. And yet here comes Jesus. And what is Jesus doing in His coming? He is breaking down that wall and He is providing us a way to the Father through what He is about to do for this woman and for you and me on the cross. And so that the condemnation that we so deserve is wiped away in forgiveness. In one sense, He offers this woman what she needed and what we all need. That's a relationship with Christ that forgives our sin. You know, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what he came to do. He didn't come to be casting stones at this woman. He came to be providing a way so that no stones would be cast at this woman. Not because she could live a perfect life, not because she could ever undo what she'd done, not for any of those reasons. She came in her sin, and he comes in his grace and offers her the opportunity to have her sin wiped away at the cross. And that's the same opportunity he makes for you and for me. And so for us, the message is the same to this woman, a simple message. When we are in our sin, when we are without faith, and we have yet to trust Christ, he doesn't come to our hearts to condemn us for eternity. He comes to our hearts to convict us of sin and our need of a Savior, to call us to himself in faith and belief, and then to send us in our new faith to allow him to change our lives, that our sinful patterns begin to change as the Holy Spirit indwells us and empowers us to do differently. That's the plan of Jesus. So quickly and so very concisely laid before this woman, one-on-one -on -one with her, and literally to all of us, whether we committed adultery or just been a very uh, competent and complete liar, at some point in our lives, he came to us and says, I didn't come to condemn you, I came to you to provide a way of salvation through what I did on the cross. For me, that was at age 17, when I realized that I was perhaps not an adulterer, but I was a sinner. And without Christ and without what he did for me on the cross, I hadn't a chance of any chance to ever enter God's eternity in heaven. The only thing eternity offered for me was the condemnation then that I might deserve now. And I decided that wasn't the direction I wanted to go. I believed by faith that Jesus paid the price for me. And you may have been 17, you may have been younger, you may be much older, whatever age it was, whatever time it was. This lady, obviously, I believe, would be a little older than my age when I came to Christ. But we all come equally, simply, by faith, understanding, convicted of our sin, that we need him. And so his offer to her is the same offer he makes to all of us. And I would hope in this room this morning, everybody here may have taken that offer already. And that Jesus Christ is indeed our Savior by faith and trust. And we look back upon a time when we can remember, you know, even if we were very little, we can kind of remember the, some of the details that we believed. And if we were much older, we probably have a much clearer remembrance of the details that we believed. And this lady obviously would be old enough at this point in time in her life to know that this is where her life changed. And she believed upon a Savior who died for her. That's the message he brings to this lady, one-on-one. -on -one. It's the same message he brings to us at some point in our life, one-on-one. -on -one. And then we come at this Sunday, as we do the first Sunday of, of every month, and we celebrate communion. Communion is so important because it's what makes this message work. Uh, have you ever had a car, but it didn't have an engine? No engine, just your car. Kind of like Fred Flintstone. Remember him, you know? You're pedaling your feet on the hard road, aren't you? Uh, it's not an easy ride. It's the engine that makes it move, correct? Some of you have tractors more than cars that you're appreciative. Rick has a tractor, you know? Without an engine, how does your tractor work? Not so good. It doesn't go very far. It doesn't uh, plow much ground. It doesn't harvest much hay. And words are cheap. If Jesus had not from these words that he offered to this woman not gone to the cross, not given his life, not paid the price, not died for sin, these words would be meaningless and cheap. 
But Jesus Christ didn't just offer cheap words. He offered real action. And the real action he offered was giving his life, suffering the pain, suffering the cross, not for his own need that he be forgiven or that he had done something wrong, but knowing that we had. And so we always look back upon what he did for us so that we never lose track or lose sight or forget that our salvation, our faith, our belief is placed in the right place, placed in the place of one who could provide, one who could be an engine for a car. But in this case, he's an engine of salvation, an engine of forgiveness. And it was his death that made it work. And without his death, it would have never worked. You can read on, and I won't read much further, but it does in the next very verse. Then Jesus spake again unto them, turning back to the people who gathered already. And he said this, I am the light of the world, verse 12. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And that's what he came to provide us through the cross, through the giving of his body and the shedding of his blood. And at communion, we remember again that cost, that price to provide us with forgiveness, to provide us with the opportunity for him to say to us at some point in our life and for us to believe it, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Father, we ask that we might place ourselves side by side with a woman so many years ago. We may not have committed the sin she did, and not all sin is equal in its result or in its consequences, but all sin is equal in this consequence. It's against you. And every sin that's committed, whether it be a simple lie or disobedient moment toward parents or murder or adultery, all of it is against you. And all of it needs forgiveness if we are to stand before you in heaven. All of it needs your touch, and that touch was provided on the cross. So we thank you that the remedy for this woman is the remedy for us, and that if we look back upon that as having been accomplished years, weeks, months, maybe even decades ago, that we come to this moment thankful that our Savior was willing out of love and compassion to provide that for me. And we pray that during this communion time we might remember the price you paid, that we might enjoy the benefits of the salvation you provided. In Jesus' name, amen. Before communion, we're going to sing a song together, Grace That Is Greater Than Our Sin. We'll put the words up. and We can remain seated as we sing, and we'll ask him to start the music and away we'll go.
The communion table is for all who have believed by that faith and trust in Jesus that he died for you. Uh, if you are here this morning and have believed in the Lord, even if you are visiting with us, we invite you to partake of the Lord's table thus it is for all who have believed and know christ it does say in the scripture before we eat of this bread that we should examine ourselves and be be partaking in a worthy manner and that means that we are not overtly sinning and knowing so and not dealing with confessing our sin unto him uh, and certainly restoring our relationship to him it is for believers but believers who are careful that we make sure when we fail and when we falter that we bring that failing to the Lord for that restoration of relationship that we need. And for those who are believers and have done that, we are invited to partake, as Paul shared in 1 Corinthians, with Christians who have partaken for now 2,000 years almost. It says, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as often as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show forth the Lord's death till he come. And that's what we do today. We remind ourselves of the price that his body paid, and the price that his body paid with the shedding of his blood from that body, both being accomplished on the cross, both being applied to our accounts as forgiveness for us when we come by belief and trust in him. And we're so thankful that he sacrificed out of love and compassion for you and for me. I'm going to ask one of our deacons to give thanks for the cup, or rather for the bread, and then we will distribute both the cup and the bread, and we'll have time for you to be able to prepare, and we will partake together. Heavenly Father, as we gather around this table, take time to reflect upon the sacrifice that was made. For you loved us so much that you sent your Son to live on this earth and to die on the cross. His body beaten and bruised, a crown of thorns crammed upon his head. And Lord, just thankful for that sacrifice that was made, for a love that was so great toward us that we might have salvation. For I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
This piece of bread, this wafer that we have in our hand, is not the body of Jesus Christ. And this wafer and this piece of bread will not forgive anybody here for sin or from sin. It is simply a symbolic reminder that Jesus gave his real body, his earthly body, to the pain and suffering of the cross. And then in the shedding of his blood and in the beating and bruising of his body, the breaking of his body, we have eternal life through him. And this piece of bread reminds us of that price that he paid. This we will do together in remembrance of his body broken for us. Likewise, the cup is a reminder of his blood that was shed. This cup will not forgive you. It will not in any way uh, take away your sin because you drink of this little cup of juice. But it is a reminder to you and a reminder to me that he gave his life's blood for the forgiveness of our sin. One of our deacons will give thanks for the cup symbolizing the blood of Christ. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank Thee that You sent Your Son to be here on earth. We thank Thee for Your grace and Your mercy that allowed it. We thank Thee for Him being willing to serve You as He needed to, to be the sacrifice, the shed the blood that would save us and wash us clean and white as snow. We thank Thee for that forgiveness, and we do pray that You'll just help each one of us to remember the great suffering and uh, things that He did for us, Lord, that we might have eternal life through Him. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. give you a couple of moments to prepare your cup, and then we'll partake together. As we partake of this cup together, let us be reminded and be thankful and filled with worship and praise that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shed his blood to cover and forgive our sin, to remove it from our accounts, that we might someday stand before the God, before the God of heaven pure and holy, not because we lived pure and holy, but because all that which was unpure and unholy has been wiped away by the forgiving blood of Jesus. We do this in remembrance of him. Let's pray. Almighty God, we remember a moment in time on this earth more important than any other moment or any other time when the sins of humanity were being uh, punished upon a cross. Jesus placed there that we might have a place in your heaven that as Jesus said, I go to prepare a mansion, that that mansion is prepared for us who know him and love him. We thank you for that. Bless us as we partake in today and encourage our hearts to follow you and to serve you. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand together and we're going to close with a song. That's not the song, though. It's uh, Love Ran Red, <laughs> I believe. Hang right on and we'll find the right song and we'll sing it together. We've learned it just at the end of when we were doing COVID and we didn't have Val here playing. And we learned this song, so we're bringing it back. I hope you remember it. They're still searching for it, apparently. That's it. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of Cross at the cross
Father, as we leave here today, may the memory of this service all through this week encourage us when we fail to come to you for the restoration of our relationship with you that is built and based upon what Jesus did for us on the cross. And may we know that your arms are open wide to re-accept us uh, in relationship, to forgive us immediately, that there's nothing between us at that moment in time, that we are your children and you are our Father. And we are so thankful for what you've done for us. We're thankful that the offer to that woman that was presented to Jesus so many years ago is the same offer to all who would either be here or watch this as a video or later and understand that you made the offer of salvation to whosoever will may come. And if there's any watching this or here today with us that needs to come, may they not leave this building or leave this time before they come to you by faith and trust and become your child by faith with a place in heaven reserved for them through the blood of our Savior. And we thank you for what you'll do for us, not just this day, but throughout this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.